Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast. If you're not already, we would really appreciate it. If you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify, those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Jack, we're delighted to have you. Um, I'm I'm going to skip the intros today altogether if you guys aren't going to get too upset, except for uh, Jack, who needs no introduction. So you lose an introduction too, Jack. Consider it a compliment. But really, the biggest compliment, and we've never said this to a guest, um, notice us slavering up front, um, but... Please tell us what is just stream of consciousness. Tell us what is first and foremost on your mind right now. Why in the world I'm awake? I knew that was coming. Yeah. In the morning on a fucking Saturday, <laughs> talking to you guys. I mean, as, I, much, I, as much as I love you guys, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, Jack. You're wasting time. I saw Jack. I saw Jack like nine hours ago. Yeah, yeah. See, that's why you are the mogul who runs this show yeah now. exactly that's how i feel now, yeah all right listen before we start getting complaints from our listeners about wasting time get that's, that um, yeah jack so yeah what aside from that and aside from all the other things that normally trundle through your mind at this time in the morning that our viewers definitely do not want to hear about um <laughs> what have you been writing about maybe i should uh, Ooh, Jack's geez, an lately. investigative journalist, everyone, while he's uh, while mean, he's warming up, gathering steam here. Um, I mean, for I've those of you about... who've been hiding under a rock and don't recognize him. And I, I've uh, written a lot of stuff Nazis. lately about, um, let's see, the, special, the international sniper competition uh, just came to an end, was writing about that. Um, third group? I mean, the third group logo? Uh, well, the third group logo I haven't written about actually, but oh, that's a whole but thing. do you want to talk about it very quickly? Yeah, yeah, we can jump in. Or as that. long as you want, but I, I'm intrigued. Um, that's why. Yes. Yeah, so the there's a, a another. This is me guiding the master in his stream of consciousness. <laughs> okay, I'm like his yogi. So this whole thing started uh, with a twentieth group, twentieth special forces group published a picture. Uh, and on the picture, there's a soldier wearing a patch on his helmet. And the I want to patch... stop you right there, and I'm going to get complained about. But I want to just reiterate what Jack said. 20th Special Forces group posted this picture, all yeah. right, and took enough time to blur out the faces. So they looked at it. Yeah, and then when when you look at the patch that's on this soldier's helmet, it is uh, the 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 icon the the symbol or the the patch of i believe it's the third ss panzer division yeah uh it has so a palm cold. tree in the background now and and it had a, the original had a swastika in front of the palm tree um this patch had that swastika removed and instead was the ss death's head skull and crossbones uh replaced on there so uh Either way, I mean, the, the the patch had, you know, Nazi iconography on it. Do they think no one would notice? There's, there, there's been a lot of, yeah, just very quickly, there's been a lot of confusion about the reporting of this. Um, for what it's worth, the 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 emblem itself is, the, uh, is taken from, I mean, the skull itself is taken from the emblem of the third panzer division now everyone may say a skull is a skull no it's particular it's the angle it's the expression um it was was unique to the third ss panzer division why is that a big deal well the third ss panzer division was formed from guys who were in the uh, ss uh totem cult fair band which is one of three parts of the ss the the totem cult fair band uh guarded the concentration camps along with the eisen group uh 
Oh, Isengrupe, Isengrupe, and someone's going to write in about. But the uh, the, oh, the, the, squad. The, the, the guys who followed in trace of the, of the forward units in Russia to exterminate partisans and Jews. So those those were the the uh, Topin Topin Kofer band, and the uh, Isengrupe were two parts, uh, two of the three parts of the SS. Third part was the Waffen SS. Anyway, this division uh, committed multiple atrocities. Um, it never served in Africa, so I just want to be clarifying. It's actually a, a what it, what has happened here is a combination of two emblems. One is the Africa Corps, which had a swastika and the palm tree, and the other is the Third SS um, Panzer Division, which had just the skull and crossbones. So they've taken both of those, put them together. So. Yeah, that that uh, that kind of blew up, uh, and the uh, special forces command initiated an investigation on it. Um, they've made you know public statements saying you know this isn't aligned with what we're trying to do here, what our values are. We're looking into it. Um, and then in the meantime, you know another uh, somebody else find, finds a picture, posts a picture of a, another. Uh, it's actually a sticker on a door down at Fort Bragg or Fort Liberty now. And it is yet another third special forces group uh, uh, team. I mean, I mean, the ODA number is on the sticker, so you know exactly where it came from. And it's the same motif of the the palm tree with the death's head on it. Um, and again, it's not it's not just like the skull and crossbones from a pirate flag or anything. It's very distinct that it, it comes from. Yeah. The SS. Yeah. Um, and so I, as I saw all of this this week, I actually went into my archives and pulled up a picture uh, that I, I posted on the Internet. And it is a picture of a third group team that I have uh, And this entire team would wear. It was the death's head, the SS death's head uh, and their version of the emblem that they made has wings coming out of the uh, skull. And it says death machine. Um, and. They wore that uh, in Afghanistan. You know, I, and I'll, I read these things and here's what goes through my mind. Okay, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Uh, and, and trust me, you know, I've got, I mean, my my father's generation family was um, pretty much wiped down the Second World War. You know what I mean? So I have no reason to, <laughs> to have anything um in uh in common with people who eulogize uh nazi member nazi emblems but I, I but we went through the same thing in the marine corps right here's my point with it, the scout snipers and branding and then you know when we delved down we realized this wasn't ideological it's just ignorance and idiocy and a sense of hey this you know it they they had some vague notion that it was german and but it but it wasn't that these kids were we're Nazis. Now, don't get me wrong. We had, I'm not saying we don't have an extremist problem. We don't have extremists in the military. Of course we do. But this isn't an indicator of it. This is just an indicator of woeful ignorance, especially in a special operations group, because we talk about being able to judge our environment and 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 uh, and fit in. Well, well, how do you how do, how do you drag up uh, you know a symbol like this and use it without even looking into its background? That's what concerns me is the immaturity. Yeah, who's yeah. doing the Photoshop and and the idiocy on the command level? You know, what I mean, what the fuck, man? <laughs> no, it's like put it on your unit website. I get it, you guys are reservists, but come on. Yeah, I mean, apparently that uh, that that company that that team belonged to, they all knew about it and everyone was fine with it. And um, I have been told like. Okay, but those guys weren't racist. You know, they're not yeah. Nazis. And maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I, I have no idea because I, I don't know all the people involved and I can't, you know, look inside their hearts and see what's there. But I mean, the question is, of course, if you're not that, if you're not a Nazi, then, then, then why, why, why are choose you wearing, yeah. why are you trying why to affiliate it? yourself with it? Um, and, and that's always the question. And like, why can we not, if we're not Nazis, why can we not just completely dispense with the Nazi insignia, just yeah. completely do away with it? We have plenty of our own stuff that's cool, that's attached to American military history that, that soldiers can wear. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can wear that's not Nazi. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. All right. I so let me ask, more. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me ask real quick because I'm, I'm, 
still trying to understand all this. From what I read, this first popped up in 2022, I think. And the command said, hey, this is a no-go. And then is this new, is this picture that's popped up again new and it's come back again? Or is it somebody just dredged up an old picture? Well, it, this was the picture was posted by 20th Special Forces Group. Okay. So um, it wasn't a case of, you know, Jack Murphy dredging up the past. Uh, I didn't post the, the picture I had until this stuff all came out. And I was like, well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, no, they, the, the Army posted the picture. Okay. Um, when, it, when the picture was taken, I don't know. Um, okay. uh, yeah, yeah I, I guess that's probably going to be a part of their investigation. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. So the third group spokesman said, hey, it's been taken out of context. I'm like, okay. I saw yeah. that and I was like, wait, what? Uh, <laughs> taken out of what? <laughs> Historical context. If that's you're going to reach yeah, back that's what I, 80 years. <laughs> that, that's what I always ask. Like when people say like it's it's we're taking it out of context. It's like, OK, what is the context? What's the context? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it to yeah. And by the way, no. the, the context, which has become so confused. Yes, it was a bad bad group of dudes they did but but they never went to africa you know the military uh i think it was the military times military.com reported that it was part of the africa core it fought under rommel yes it did fight under rommel but in europe all right rommel for, in the uh in the battle for france and yes they did commit atrocities against africans uh they they butchered the thousands uh hundreds possibly thousands of moroccan soldiers uh but it was in france um but anyway, yeah, that's a minor point. I my feeling is there's nothing to see here, right here. My feeling is yes, we have things to see as we dig up what happened on six January and and the lamentable number of uh, military personnel who were involved in that. You know, um, there's if, of course there's extremism in the military. You guys know all this. What do you expect when you take a cross section of the um, of American society who are not among the most privileged. You know, we always say, even at the height of our recruiting, we're not taking the, we're not getting the top of the high school class. We're not getting the kids um, who are going to go to college with uh, athletic scholarships or academic scholarships. We're getting the guys who are barely, you know, who are struggling. 75% of U.S. recruits come from one-parent families, right? As an example, that doesn't mean they're bad families. I'm just saying this is the demographic. It's up to the military to change the way they think. And the change the way they think isn't giving them a Friday afternoon, you know, a class on why extremism is bad. It's learning. It's learning to, to face hardship and go through all the shit that we have and, and de having to depend on the dude next to you who doesn't look like you. That's what that's what undermines extremism and racism. It's putting units through that type of tough training. They don't have to go to combat. And if we just focused on that instead of all these classes, um, I, I think we'd be on the right path or chasing after logos. You know, hey, absolutely ban it and spank everyone involved for being just stupid beyond belief. But let's not make this an indicator of extremism because it's it's the wrong tree yeah it's always the you know difficult conversation i mean sometimes with veterans but also with civilians to try to like parse out some of the nuances that um you know you're, you're right when you you point out there there are studies that have been done that show you know extremism amongst uh military or military veterans is actually a little bit lower um than baseline um <laughs> pointing out that, you know, the military isn't like an incubator for extremism or anything like that. Um, but then if you drill down into the statistics a little bit more, um, you will find like some frightening numbers, um, you know, people who believe in the white replacement theory. Um, and what is and that? Actually, What's the white well, replacement that's the whole, well, Let me the explain it to you. Theory. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Go, go for it. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> Let us no, just, let, let us know what you're doing to us. <laughs> yeah, what's your fucking plan, dude? <laughs> I'll lose my car for this, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> let me seriously though. Um, so one of my Andy, what you're going back to what you were saying, um, and I am going to predict that this is going to be wait. What's the white replacement theory? I'm, oh no. I'm, <laughs> no, go on, Chase. Isn't it go called on. the Great Replacement Theory? But we should explain what it is, right? If we mention it. I don't want to mention it because I don't know exactly what it, I've it's, been at those meetings. It's just, so a, I don't know. It, it's just a like white supremacist conspiracy theory that's pretty prevalent. That you know, um, I, I mean, I guess the idea goes 
that we're opening up our southern border to let all of these uh, immigrants, illegal migrants into the country. And it, the idea is that they will demographically displace white people and be a block, a voting block of leftists that will just vote for communism. I oh, guess. I, oh, right. Yeah. I mean, kind this, of the demographic, is... the demographic shift that's removing the yeah. base from the, yeah. That that time is not on their side. So I'm actually we, quite excited yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, one of my my first uh, going back to what Andy was saying about uh, learning. Um, one of the uh, one of my first roommates in the barracks when I was in the Marine Corps uh, was a kid. I won't I won't say his name, but um, probably about a week or so after we uh, first moved into these new barracks, he just pulled me aside. He's like, listen, man, I just need to be honest with you about something. I was raised in a uh, clan family, you know, KKK. And, um, oh, you know, I, this is all really new to me. He said between boot camp and this first, you did, know, did you tell camp. him it was new to you too? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm, oh, come on, man. I'm from the Jersey shore. You're, it's not, you're, new my, to me. you're my first um, clan <laughs> rack mate. Yeah. So <laughs> we just sat and talked about to get it. A picture. Yeah. It wasn't like some hallmark moment. We just talked about it. And at the end of it, I was like, listen, man, are you going to, fucking shoot me in the back when you know when we're in, uh you know when we're out there he's like no I said are you gonna have my back when we're out there he's like yeah i was like then i don't give a fuck and that's how it was and we just we got along he never you know he went on to do other things he moved out of the unit and um we never had a problem with it and uh, i think like you said if we get away from the whole uh you know here's a everybody do it has to do a stand down on a friday afternoon and yeah. uh you know just talk about it i think if people are able to bring their experiences to these things and say, this is what I learned from it. This is what happened. This is what I learned from it. It'll not necessarily work itself out. And like you said, if the bullshit raises its head, whether it's a, you know, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever it is, slap, you know, smack the, the ones who were the perpetrators and learn a lesson, keep it moving. You know, this once a year talking about a shit is just not going to be, it's not enough. Can you agree? It kind of feels like very HR y, like very corporate. Like it's you checking to, a box. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what exactly what it is. It's checking a box. And like and none of the information not, gets anywhere. Yeah. Like they literally will hold people's leave until they've gotten this done. You know, they check that box along like cybersecurity and all the other shit. So it just this uh, is it's it's this usual is, approach. As of you know, as of zero three, zero four hundred hours Zulu, all racism will end. Yeah, <laughs> in this unit. <laughs> Sign here. Well, it's it's also the classic like this Afghan A N A N A unit is going from amber to green. Like <laughs> you know, it's like very it's a very army thing. Yeah. Oh, and then we're back to and then we're back to red again. How'd this happen? Yeah. yeah. New commander. Yeah. And I'm sure we're gonna get smacked on clickbait and you know why are we being woke with all this? <laughs> well, it's it's something that needs to be. You know, I, I hate to be that person that talks to the people in the comments, but you need to get over it. This is real. It happened. It needs to be talked about. So if you don't like it, oh, well, go, you know, go follow somebody else. Yeah, Jack, I don't know. It's, Jack, yeah. I was, no, go go ahead. I, I was saying that I, I, I know we took you down that that path and, and I feel bad now. Maybe you didn't want to go down that path, but it was uh, very interesting. Nevertheless. Not say well, you know. I mean, the I mean the the symbology, the lack of uh, historical context, the fact that we really do have to understand that that Americans don't learn about history in high school or anything, and so uh, for the most part, and uh, but that there is you know there is an issue and we address it, and it's you know not so make such a big deal of it. Yeah, but, um, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I mean, as you guys maybe implied a little bit, my guess is nothing happens. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's next, a big storm in a teacup, and then I think everyone next moves time on. when the whoever is doing the fucking Photoshop, maybe pick other skulls. There's a plethora of them <laughs> out like, there. Hello, so much know. easy. All right. Yeah. Jack, what what next? Well, I mean, the Havana syndrome's coming back, and I know Jack's. It's a it's pretty nascent anyway. Like you're still yeah. working on it, but. He's right well, next door. Uh, yeah, we've got our own personal interest with Mark, Mark P, mm. who he has Moscow syndrome, but it's very, very similar to Havana. Yeah, there is no Moscow syndrome. Incidents is the uh, the term we're using now. What is that? Um, anomalous health incidents, I believe, is the acronym. 
Um, AHI. But I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm back on this story or researching it, uh, interviewing people, talking to scientists and doctors and people who are very smart. Um, and um, hopefully a story comes out of it. Uh, I've, I, I mean, I think there's enough there. Um, I've also been talking to some of the victims, people who are hit with something, an anomalous health incident. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I, I do believe, you know, I guess like, you know, not to bury the lead. I mean, I believe that some of these people were indeed hit with some sort of a, a microwave weapon. Um, and it's just, a, again, it's another one of these stories where you have to drill down into the nuances and you have to look at the data, um, look at the scientific studies that have been done on, on the victims. Um, and some, some of these people uh, have very odd abnormalities um, that the, in the, in the MRI machine shows some of those um, abnormalities that I'll have to write about more in depth. Um, so, I don't know. It's 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 an interesting subject. It's a very complicated subject to pick through. Um, so yeah, pour one yeah, out. Do we for, have oh, do we have yeah. any numbers and any idea of how many people have been affected with this? I mean, somewhere between two hundred and a thousand. Um, I haven't I haven't seen anything solid. Um, I think there are probably two, I think there's like maybe two hundred and twenty like people who are sort of like on the books, so to speak, in the okay. as far as the government's concerned. Um, but I mean. At a certain point, this story, you know, the victims, it, it, the, the list expands and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. And I really don't want to be dismissive of anyone, at, certainly not out of hand. But you do start to wonder, are, are all of these people really being blasted with something? Um, mm. uh, and, and it's a question of picking through all of that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like no the pit right. thing, right? Yeah. Because I, I happen to uh and i call it accidentally fall into x i i don't know how and uh, i was reading some of the uh comments about it and i guess 60 minutes is coming out with the they story, did a story, yeah. story um about you know uh revealing some information or whatever but i was reading some of the comments and a ma big majority of them were saying things that never happened for a thousand dollars and you know just saying it never happened you know it's a bunch of uh, crap and uh, i don't know a whole lot about it but i was just curious if it was like 10 people, you know, or um, I'm assuming that all of these people probably share in common locations, you know, like Cuba, uh, Moscow, stuff like that. Or is it spread out all over the world? I don't want you to tell too much of your information you're gathering. Well, but... here's, here, here's like a little like anecdote. And, and there's many, there's many anecdotes that, that could be shared. But when, when uh, people first started getting hit in Havana, um, the, there were three cia agency personnel down there all three of them get hit and get sent back home then they send another three guys to replace them on tdy mm -hmm. people who have no they have no idea why the previous crew was sent back home <laughs> all three of them like that scene hit. in the big red one all, all of those three the three replacements get hit they send them back home they send another three td wires down there and they get hit and now by, by this point, you have State Department people who have also been hit down there. You have Canadians who have been hit. So the idea that um, this is some sort of like mass hallucination, mm -hmm. like it's just this like psychosomatic shared hallucination that people are having is, I think, ludicrous. And I don't think it's supported by the science or the data Um and, and because I'm especially when you consider that some of this was in the blind. I mean, these people yeah. had no idea what Havana syndrome was. It's yeah. not like they were all talking to each other yeah. and comparing notes. Um, you could make that argument today. Sure. Um, but at that time, no. Um, and so people started coming down, being afflicted with these um, very similar symptoms. Crazy. And uh, and again, when some of those early Havana victims or looked at under uh, functional magnetic resonance imagery, uh, the findings do show a difference between mm -hmm. them and other people who have traumatic brain injuries. Like if you were to look at baseline TBIs, um, their brains are different. Gotcha. Uh, something different happened there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's a lot to it's a lot to pick through. Yeah. Cool. 
cool. And I, we, oh, go ahead, Andy. Sorry. No, no, no. I go, go on. No, I was going to say, and, and again, without you giving away too much of what you're writing about, do we have a suspect here? I'm, I keep seeing China, but I, I mean, do we have any proof of anything? You know, I, well, I, I can say I don't have any proof. Um, I, I think the United States government um, has actually quite a bit on this on this topic. Um, pretty much everyone is pointing the finger at Russia. No. Um, okay. But do have I seen proof of that? Have I do I know proof positive that uh, that the Russians were behind it? I don't. Okay. I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't show you. But. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't want to go too deep into it, but gotcha. I do know yeah. the United States government and uh, and especially DOD mm. um, and like the JSOC guys actually, um, to their credit, took this issue very seriously and like kind of leaned into it. Like, hey, let's fix the glitch. Let's fix yeah. the problem. How do we defend against this? Whereas the CIA was burying their head in the sand and mm. just in denial as but, things got worse and worse. And giving people settlements, but also denying it. Well, they gave a few people settlements. Yeah. Um, to, you know, almost uh, it feels like hush money almost. Mm. Um, but I mean, I know other people who uh, believe they've been hit with whatever this is. Uh, they've experienced a anomalous health incident, and they're like, "What are people talking about these settlements? Like, we haven't even begin mm. given like a number to call to even like yeah. go like start this process." So, I think that it's been very selective in in who they've kind of tried to help yeah gotcha Jack, what it it intrigues me when you said directed energy uh weapon can you be can you be specific uh about it i know you know mark mark p I, talked about it a little bit uh I can't, speculation I can't, but... be, I can't be specific until uh, um really because we haven't captured a device as far as i know yeah. we don't have yeah yet. um but i mean can you can you but, it, I don't mean, but can you talk yeah, about yeah. the capability so, a little bit the, for the, the benefit of? So microwaves, uh, in in the way I'm I'm kind of throwing around that term is a bit unscientific. Um, microwaves can encompass a broad uh, band of different types of of waves that can be beamed from a emitter. Um, it could be a single point emitter. Uh, it could be um, two. There's one theory that it's two emitters, and then they cro they cross and they get the the victim in the cross beam. Uh, from the anecdotal, um, you know, victim statements, it seems like the device is able to target like an entire room or rooms in a uh, in a residence. Um, so, like one guy was telling me about how it hit me in my living room. It was really bad. I went into my bedroom and I tried to like walk it off and pretend it wasn't uh hurting me um and that's it the thing worse. isn't it the victims can point to at least for the most part a a point in time when they when they felt suddenly felt something oh, right? absolutely yeah, yeah. and absolutely. so it's yeah. not like legionnaire's disease where it comes up later you know they all have that one thing in common it's like bam, yes. i suddenly felt all and, and when 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 this particular guy left his he was in his living room in his bedroom he was getting hit when he walked into his kitchen he started to feel better hmm. like the the kind of the pressure was relieved um that he was feeling um there's geez you get me talking about this stuff andy so there, no, I, the, I think the, it's interesting the interesting, sure. the interesting thing the other interesting thing i think is that the United States has this technology. That's um, yeah, that's it. what I was that's that's um, what I was gonna ask next. And, and and that's what why it's a little frustrating for the CIA to pretend mm -hmm. like or, or I should say the the head shed, the seventh floor anyway. Mm -hmm. Um you know DST, the D Directorate of Science and Technology, I'm told in their in their classified assessment, they assessed that there was some sort of microwave beam weapon used on some of these people. Um but the seventh floor didn't want to hear that. Um, and, um, it, it's frustrating for a lot of people that the CIA still pretends that they don't understand what this is or what's happening when we have the exact same technology. Mm -hmm. Um, we have small man portable microwave beam weapons. Um, now I, I, I have no, um, I have not been able to find any accounts of them ever being deployed and used operationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, a military personnel to turn that device on 
it requires very high levels of approval and authorization, like up to NSA level, if not beyond, um, even to even to think about turning that thing on. Um, but the point is, we do have it. They yeah. can fire in a, in a in a three to five second burst. And the idea behind it is that you can use it to blow some people out of a safe house. You know, if you got some Drones. terrorists, kind of kind of drone, kind of swarm. You can, you, you can hit them with this thing. It makes them very, very uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You'll have a headache, that sort of thing. Um, and it'll get the guy up and moving around, hopefully out of his safe house, get him on his cell phone, making phone calls. It's a way to uh, coerce the types of behaviors that we might want to see uh, at certain points. Um, so we have this technology. It's not It's not like some exotic novel um, technology that is like this uh, a mystery. What is a mystery, though, is be- we've never, and because we have medical ethics <laughs> laws in America, um, we've obviously never tested this device on human beings. Um, so there are questions about what type of beam do you hit people with that replicates the uh, the, the symptoms and, and the data uh, that the Havana victims have? Because we, we don't know exactly how these waves impact the human body. Um, we know that it's different than other traumatic brain injuries. We know that, you know, a normal microwave will, you know, kind of give you a sunburn. Um, but this is something different. It's they're they're getting through the skull and into the gray matter in your brain. And that takes a different type of calibration. And again, I'm not explaining that quite well because I'm not a scientist. Yeah. Um, my, my point is uh, that it's just a different type of microwave that is being tuned in a way um, to create that impact in human beings. And we're still trying to study um, the victims and study microwaves to try to understand, you know, how, you know, a person, you know, essentially a person's brain is cooked from the inside out. It's, um, I mean, it's potentially a, an, an extraordinarily useful weapon. You know, it, it's, uh, in, in the end, it's still, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, minimizing what happened to the Havana syndrome uh, victims, but uh, for the sake of argument, you know, it's a non-lethal weapon. Um, and as Jack points out, with uh, with effects that are um, perhaps more useful and diverse than kinetic weapons. So, uh, and and potential use, by the way, in countering swarms of drones. Uh, I, I so- had a uh, I had an old school guy. He was a um, chief of station in Moscow. And he was telling me that, you know, the interesting thing about the Russians isn't that they have, they're not beating us in like the tech race or anything like that. They don't have any technology that we don't have, but they think about technology and they think about ways to use it that we would never consider. Um, And that's that's just an interesting, like little cultural aside. I'll give you a great example of that. And uh, that's a great point, Jack. I think it's very well put the, at the outset of the war in Ukraine, um, the Russians, the, the Ukrainians started getting a high number of uh, percentage of soldiers with um, uh, laser burned eyes, right, blinded. And two things, okay, resulted from this. One was it, it, soldiers can deal with fear of general fear of death or wounding, but when they know there's a specific fear of being blinded and they've seen people happen, it's it's a terrifying. I mean, you can imagine that, and they don't know where it comes from. Well, Russians were using laser designators um as a reconnaissance by fire you know as they mm-hmm. came to an area um they they would just laser everything every likely op and they were blinding guys you know blinding initially reconnaissance units and then soldiers and the ukrainians had to go into fast production mode on laser safe goggles that they pushed out to all of us this. this was this was in the first few weeks of the war as, as the russians mm-hmm. were approaching kiev never made the news um but it but i you know i was i'm not saying i was there you know but but i was there and 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 watching them you know react and then think through and adapt in an extraordinary short period of time to counter this so yeah great example of what you were talking about not new technology but being used in a way which by the way we couldn't use it but the russians can always um escape by saying you know hey we were designating targets and i it's not our fault if people got in the way. Yeah, so then that begs the question as far as, you know, if this is being used seemingly exclusively against intelligence officers, how do you counter it? 
I mean, the operations still have to go on, you know, uh, right. uh, Intel still needs to be collected. What do people go out wearing the, the literal tinfoil caps, you know, like how, how do we count? Well, it? it's uh, <laughs> funny you mentioned that. Uh, so Jack has one right here. There, there, there is, uh, there, I don't know how far along we are in developing countermeasures. I can tell you some like initial conversations I've had with people. Um, there's one idea is that, you know, we should have sensors that we can give to our people overseas that they can put inside their residence mm -hmm. and it'll warn them. At least you'll have some sort of a warning that something is happening. Um, I spoke to one person who uh, is an expert in his field, and he believes that we can design clothing, windows, drapes, things like that, that will actually block these beams. He thinks it's possible. Um, it would take it takes some really high end technology to do it, um, and it, and it's not cheap. <laughs> but yeah. um, there there are ways to develop countermeasures. And the other the, the not high tech option to to your question, Jason, of course, is retaliation mm. right if they're if you know it's that that, that scene uh what was the uh sean connery says you know they put one of yours in the hospital you put one of theirs in the morning kind of yeah. yeah yeah uh so mm. i i and i think that's that may be actually the reason why the cia has kind of tried to bury this um mm. because they may not want to get into a global tit for tat mm. with the russians where we're yeah. disappearing people yeah um that's a little speculative, um, but I, I just have to imagine. I mean, if this was real, okay, if if the Russians were blasting American government personnel with microwaves, the the president could quite clearly sign a covert finding because um, yeah. it'll be ruled uh, in it's in self defense yeah. and it's directly related to U.S. national security, yeah. um, and so he could sign a lethal finding for something like this, like. No questions asked, really. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, as far as how yeah. I understand how the law works, um, they could do it. That's really an interesting theory. And I think there's, there's some substance there, Jack, that it's a, um, attribution puts you in a corner. I mean, explicit right. attribution now. I mean, it was the same thing. Well, with yeah, the drone, what are you going to do? The now? drone right. that, that hit Tower 22, you know, I mean, <laughs> obviously an Iranian. Uh, drone and and yet it we don't and obviously we know it but we just and they know it that we know it but yeah yeah it's one it's, of these funny just, things it's, it's rules it's, of the game you know you it, don't bring exactly it exactly it's like this funny thing like you know we talked about you know sabotage operations in russia and you know the russians kind of like shrug it off like oh whatever you know and, or then i mean another example of course is the Nord Stream pipeline bombing yeah. I mean, we still don't know what the fuck really happened there, um, but it blew up. And, and like very quickly, the governments of like Denmark and Sweden were like, yeah, we're done investigating. Yeah. Like inconclusive, <laughs> inconclusive. And it's just it's just very it funny. Was, uh... like, how, how we, we ignore things we don't want to address. Yeah. Much like it's styled. Evidently, you know, it just didn't react well to cold weather. We just didn't think about this <laughs> because we don't because we don't we don't want to go down these. You know, both us and the Russians yeah. don't necessarily want to go down all these rabbit holes um, and get into a, a, a sort of tit for tat, be it diplomatic or, or you know, maybe lethal. Um, so, yeah, it's very funny how we, we kind of act like, you know, it's like, you know, a little kid coming downstairs and you know, their mom's like, did you clean your room? And the kid is like, yeah, I did. And the parent just doesn't want to know yeah. if they cleaned it or not. You know, you don't want to go upstairs and actually inspect. Uh, it's just a very funny sort of dynamic. We are. We, we've we typically in the past just not been subtle enough to play by rules of the game. But I think, you know, we are getting there. I think Syria taught us a lot. I think it was fortunate that we had mainly a soft footprint in Syria. And so we had to, uh, you know, we had guys who were tuned to that to learn how to coexist uh, in the same area with Russian forces. I'm not saying get along, obviously know when to draw the line and spank them, but in between that, how to, how to, you know, continue steady state and where it really, where it really comes to the fore is in the Middle East, right? You know I mean? With Israel, Israel, Hezbollah, uh, Iran, they're all, you know, Israel will kill Iranians, but outside Iran. Um, for the most part, until recently, yeah. until recently, when they blew up, well, 
someone blew um blew up gas pipelines in Iran. And by the way, there's an behind the scenes there is an extraordinary cyber war taking place mm. um with with uh pro Israel proxies um doing significant things to Iranian infrastructure and what what made the news with the gas pla uh pipelines, but they, that that wasn't I don't think that was a cyber attack. But anyway, rules of the game, yeah. Subtle understanding them. When do you when do you need to adhere to them and when to break them? Geopolitics one oh one. Yeah, and I think the second and third order uh effects of this whole I keep saying Havana syndrome thing because I don't remember the other thing you said. Okay. Um <laughs> is when we Anomalous. do, yeah, when Anomalous. we do come up, if and when we do come up with a countermeasure to it or a defense against it. Now, how then does that affect, again, intelligence or military operations? Because it's like, if it's expensive, as you say, to do it, who do we give it to? And does that now point them out as an intelligence officer? It's like, hey, this guy or girl coming into this country is State Department, but we know that they just gave them this special type of window in their place, this you know special type of whatever it is. So how does that affect those sorts of things? I mean, it's it sounds it sounds asinine, but I think there's also thoughts behind the scenes. Do we want to develop a countermeasure to a technology that we also have? We'll have. And do, do we want to dump millions and millions of dollars into developing a a countermeasure um, that once our enemies know it exists, they're going to develop that countermeasure as well? Um, so yeah, it's convoluted, man. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Cool. Do you, we we will stay tuned to the high side. Right, Sean Naylor paid me Thank some you. money to to mention that. <laughs> I I am told that your ratings shot up. Jack, please say yes after our last episode of Eyes On when you were a guest. But we had astonishingly high uh, number of views because your picture was on the front. But anyway, you will <laughs> Sean, you will Sean very kindly mention that um, subscription rates for the high side went up after that episode, which is good because you should all subscribe to the high side. Absolutely. I yeah, no, thank my you. Free subscription. Um, yeah, my my when I finish writing this story about Havana, it'll be on, on the high mm -hmm. side. Um, and there's a few other big projects that Sean and I are working on. Awesome. I. I'd like to D, do we we've got a few minutes, right? We got Jack. I, yeah, I we're good. A, um Jack's good. Jack, he'll so, he'll be here all day if we need him. Oh, you no, I won't. <laughs> because I'm going no, upstate. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> no one contradicts D on this show. <laughs> um Jack, what what else? Okay. So first of all, as as our guest, is I I mean I've got a couple of questions for you that but before we get to kind of rummaging around in the garbage, do you have uh, what what do you want to talk about on a more cerebral level? Because invariably, whatever comes out of your mouth is cerebral. <laughs> With the exception of that one Friday night in, uh, where was it? Down by the river in uh, Alexandria. I digress. Go on. What came out of your mouth <laughs> that night was definitely it is, cerebral. Uh, it is and... way, way too early in the morning for me to have cerebral thoughts about anything. Okay. Yeah. What, what do you want to, I mean, is there anything, anything that's, that's a burning topic that you think are the, the, the more sophisticated eyes on listeners would, would appreciate more sophisticated as opposed to the team house. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that's, that's about the gist of it. You I, know, I've got a question yeah, for you. I don't know. If, I've got a question for you. I don't know. And this isn't me um, delving into prurient garbage, but um I am I'm intrigued ex about what exactly happened with the first group uh, commander, former first group commander. Um, and I'll tell you why, Jack, because uh, for a while, that whole case, you, you know, you know, the one I mean, became um, within the soft community. It, it was uh, and and I, I may be out of date here, but it was portrayed as being, hey, here's what happens when TBI and PTSD is left you know, un, untreated and this guy had an exemplary record and then he suddenly went off the rails. And then troubling comments started coming out. And it concerns me when these things happen because I hate for all the fact that because it may have happened badly, you know, in one case that everyone is painted with that same brush. I worded that very badly. 
but you know what I mean over to you. Um, but there are still people yeah. who eulogize this person and say that it was a case of PTSD that, you know. Well, that was certainly his story. And I mean, the, the person we're talking about held his family hostage, barricaded inside the house. Yeah. Do you want to and... just get, give a quick synopsis of the story? I'm sorry. I, I jumped into yeah, it. Yeah, it was uh, this is going back a few years, but it was yeah. uh, Owen Ray. And he was uh, the yeah the commander of First Special Forces Group, and then he went on to he was the guy who carried the nuclear football for uh, Obama for a little while, and then his uh, he went on to he was like a chief of staff at I Corps, um, I believe. Uh, this is going back a few years, so I'm yeah. sorry if my memory. It, a little when, bit off. when you read his career, you know, in Apocalypse Now, when uh, um, Willard. Captain Willard is, you guys seen Apocalypse Now, right? Who has not seen yeah. that? Anyway, Captain Willard's going through Kurtz's file and he's like, it was perfect, maybe too perfect. And it's almost like Owen Ray's record, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, then, yeah, he has this this moment where he uh, holds his family hostage and has an armed standoff with the police. Um, and at, in the Which will affect your security clearance. In, in the in in the aftermath of all of this, you know, yes, he he tried to blame it on untreated PTSD and TBIs and, and make it, you know, a soldier story about. And I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of a, in my opinion, there's a little bit of narcissism involved in, you know, you're still going through like your court trial here, and you're already out front trying to like, you know, spin this story and, and kind of weave your memoir about a soldier's return home. It's like, hey, you're not quite there yet. And I, I think he, uh, as I, again, as I recall, I believe he, he did um, catch a conviction in civilian courts and, and do some jail time. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, we've had our own cases like this senior, senior officers. It particularly upsets me when senior officers claim that they have PTSD uh, and then you delve into the records and you think, where the hell did they get PTSD? You know, it's no. um, we, we had our own case, uh, a guy named Shane Tomko. Um, actually, you know, we had more than one um, very si similar case. It wasn't holding hostage, but he he did criminal stuff and is now in jail in Norfolk uh, for, among other things, sexual abuse of a minor. Uh, but he made colonel in the United States Marine Corps and was same sort of career you know he did time at jsoc and everyone's like oh my god poor dude no he was a fucking criminal who masqueraded as a marine officer and made colonel you know i mean not just not just did okay but in, but vaulted to the head so you know when we talk about extremism and patches i think our bigger concern is how we screen officers frankly i mean we have had i mean you just look at the papers across the board i mean we we have had a lot of reliefs for things that just shouldn't have yeah. shouldn't have happened. And yeah, those are I the mean, best of the best. Those are guys who get slated for command. You know, I mean, it's there is something fundamentally wrong. And I throw this out for comments for the listeners, obviously. They, they, but I, I can say, um, you know, last time I said, hey, most officers are not warriors. Um, I think that's necessary. The United States military is a big bureaucracy, and I'm fine with that. Um, I'm not fine with officers who uh, develop this persona that everyone eulogizes, you know, short hair, big, you know, big guy. I don't like big guys anyway. Um, good looking, uh, you know, deep voice, and they will go far in the military. All right. Especially if they're physically fit, they will make yeah. lieutenant colonel. Um and and they build up this this iconic hey man he's a warrior yeah he's this a media persona. yeah the yeah, persona yeah, yeah. building oh god and then it's impossible it's not but then everyone's like shocked I mean we could reel after name after name to include yeah. many general officers uh, who develop the sun god syndrome and do stuff that is really fucked up well, well people you're right people are are shocked when these folks come unwound but a lot of that is it's also there's like a lot it didn't of just happen. Involved. Because yeah, if it you, didn't... you wind back the clock, there's a lot of warning signs with yeah. with a lot of these guys. Um, and the the military is the army has tried to put some 
rail guards um, in place recently, you know, the screening they do for, you know, to see if someone is a toxic leader. Um, before yeah, but they that's, take that's screening in. by the time, that's screening for commander. I mean, if they're yeah. a toxic leader, they shouldn't be a fucking officer. <laughs> they shouldn't have made it. Yeah. I, you know? <laughs> I mean, you're still leading people. <laughs> it's like, Let's wait till that lieutenant colonel. Then we're really going to screen them out. Like the, <laughs> the dudes who are psychopaths. It's okay. They'll get taped. Don't worry about it, man. Let them into OCS. By the time they reach 05, we'll, we'll get them out. But well, in the it's meantime, funny. we've got you're lots of see, staff work. Even to see them. that uh, that board that screens for toxic leaders, you see senior officers trying to intervene because they're the sea daddy. Uh, yeah. You know, of, yeah. You know, they got their boys out there they're mentees that they're you know this guy fits the the mold this is he has the persona that the senior guy likes that wants to promote um up the ranks and uh but the the you know the board convening on toxic leaders is saying nah not this guy and you see the officers trying to intervene in the board and find ways to subvert it uh, i mean yeah Wait, I is mean, there an actual board hey that hey jason that would yeah, that there, would yeah, never happen is. in the marine Corps, right never so there really is a board again. that screens for that. Yeah, for for I believe it's for um people who are taking a battalion command, um yeah. I, and yeah, yeah there is there yeah. is a process it's like decap or something. Again, I'm sorry it's so early in the morning I can't remember the acronym. Yeah, it, it's me, it's but. a significant process. They brought it in um, a couple of years ago, wow. and so when you are eligible for um, battalion command, you go through. You know they'll take your whole cohort, and and it's like. I didn't know. It's like OCS. I mean, I, I haven't been through it, but when you read what they do, you know, it's um, they do a PFT, they do um, interviews, they do a 360, you know, they, there's a 360 assessment done of them to that point, And then they get peer evals done as they go through this. They do the leadership reaction courses uh, that we did at OCS, you know, where you have to get across uh, a crevasse, a, a feet, a, a fake crevasse, you know, with a plank and two pieces of rope and five idiots, you know, all, all of this stuff. I mean, it just seems bizarre that, and this isn't because the army is doing it. I would say the same thing regardless of service, but it's just yeah, bizarre trying. that we're testing people for leadership when they get to that stage, because what is wrong with judging them on their, on their records, on their performance reviews. Well, That's what it's I was because say. the performance <laughs> review system is broken and it's too inflated. Yes. So yeah. fix that. Don't bring in this ridiculous, you know, uh, hey, we, we've got to make up for all the shit screening we haven't done to this point. Three yeah, days. I don't understand where the toxic leadership would come out in any of those things. Like maybe in an interview, like if you ask them a scenario question, oh, it might be me. like, you know what, fuck, you kill them you, all. But believe me, if you if you are on time limit and some idiot drops the you know the the package you're supposed to be carrying across mm -hmm. that crevasse at the last minute, um, people revert to their true nature. <laughs> But, the, but, but you know they what? know people, they're being but, but people this, revert right? to their true nature. Sh uh, they should have done. They should have. They've had all of company command to evaluate these people in effing command. Why are they waiting until lieutenant colonel to give them this weird board? I guess my my where my question is is like, do they know they're being screened for toxic leadership? Yeah. Because if they yeah. do, why would they show that during the screening? They're going to put on their best face. So well, they, like they Andy are, said. But they, they go, uh, I believe, again, I'm not totally schooled up on the whole process, but I believe they go in the interview like your subordinates and, and people okay. like that. Gotcha. Okay. Huh. I, I'm a big believer in 360 evaluation. I think that's one way potentially that we prevent the natural progression towards inflation in performance reports. Um, I am, yes, of course, you know, I, the, the counter argument is, hey, you're going to get leaders who cater to popularity. No, a guy who's a decent leader isn't going to do that. And Marines and even soldiers can tell when an officer is simply, you know, catering to them or trying to suck up to them. And they despise that. They would rather have an asshole who is incompetent. I mean, an asshole who is competent, you know, who's going to keep them alive, even though he was an asshole than uh, someone who is trying to be popular. So I think 360 is a good way of doing it. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There are some really good tools that they brought in 
uh, during these three days. My point is, why just bring? Why why not just implement them as continual assessment, which is far more effective. You only do a three day board when you haven't had eyes on uh, the person beforehand. You know, for instance, like the Brits do a three day uh, commissioning board. All right, um, where they put them through all this stuff. But anyway. Uh, not, you know, great, great initiative, Army, but um, they, there are other things, you know, look at your performance evaluation, look at how you how you bring people in, look how you assess them. And then you got the anything? Yeah. No, I'm good. Cool. Yeah. Jackalope, you got anything else? No, no. All right, guys, Thanks. listen, don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to check out the high side sub stack with Jack and uh, Sean Naylor. Don't forget to check out Andy's Substack, Andy's Twitter. Everything will be in the bio and in the show notes. You can click those links there. It's very easy. Uh, my, also, my mine and Jack's book. Yep, those will be there also. And the most important thing, not the most, it's the most important thing. Patreon.com slash the team house. Help support the shows, both Eyes On and the team house. YouTube is screwing us. I don't want to get into it. But I will. Hey, Patreon.com slash the team house, please. Thank you. How much is that? It's five bucks a month. That's you nothing. get you get ad free audio and yeah. video. You get a I bonus mean, bonus episodes what? per month with just the guys shooting the shit, answering your questions. You can ha have your questions answered live on the team house too. We do uh give the Patreon subscribers uh precedence for that. So yeah, there's a lot of benefits and it also the most important thing is it supports the show. That is, yeah. It's Thanks. something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Five bucks, that's absolutely nothing. <laughs> thanks, right. Jack. Appreciate it, brother. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Jack. Andy. Everyone.